committee will come to order. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Steve Schaub, the chair of the committee. I want to apologize for uh, not being able to start on time. We had votes on the floor, so uh, that is the reason we are starting a little bit late. So for any inconvenience to anybody, uh, we apologize. And I would like to welcome everyone, my colleagues and our distinguished uh, witnesses to the Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific hearing this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Fowley Mavega, our ranking member, unfortunately, cannot be with us today, but we are pleased uh, to have Representative uh, Tulsi Gabbard uh, from Hawaii, and, uh, uh, and she will be able to uh, uh, take the position as ranking member here this, uh, this afternoon. Um, we are also joined by uh, Ms. Meng, or will be this afternoon, and I would ask unanimous consent that she be permitted to sit in uh, with the subcommittee and be recognized to speak after all members of the subcommittee uh, have been recognized and without objection uh, so ordered. Um, the Bangladesh story has been an impressive one. And it is a nation that has worked hard to lift itself from the war-torn ruins left behind by its bloody 1971 War of Independence from Pakistan. Over the last 20 years, there has been market progress, especially on the economic front, as Bangladesh has grown into a crucial link between the dominant economies within the Indo-Pacific Economic Corridor. Strategically located between Asia's two powerhouses, India and China, and prominently situated within the arc of Islam that extends from the Middle East into Southeast Asia, Bangladesh plays a key role in maintaining regional stability. As a moderate, secular nation, Bangladesh has become an important security partner for the United States in the fight against terrorism and Islamic extremism in South Asia, as well as a collaborator on human humanitarian assistance, peacekeeping operations, and maritime security. While there have been some noteworthy economic and social improvements, particularly over the past decade, Bangladesh is still a very poor country with an estimated 153 million people who live in poverty. And sadly, conditions for many working Bangladeshis remain dangerous and unhealthy. Six months after the tragedy at Rana Plaza, in which 1,127 Bangladeshi workers were killed, changes have been slow to materialize. Corruption also remains a significant obstacle to Bangladesh's place in the world economy, and the government's sluggish efforts to combat it will only serve as a further impediment to its economic growth. As Bangladesh approaches its national elections, which are likely to take place in early January, the country is in a state of political turmoil. In Bangladesh, politics, as usual, I am afraid, takes on a much harsher meaning than it does in many societies. As the major political parties ramp up their campaigns, operatives utilize strikes, riots and blockades to destabilize the country and call attention to their grievances. When I visited Bangladesh about two weeks ago, we arrived at the onset of a three-day general strike, essentially shutting down commerce called by the opposition Bangladesh National Party, BNP. During our stay, there were numerous reports of violence. While in Dhaka, I had the opportunity to meet with both the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, of the Awami League and the opposition leader, former Prime Minister Khalida Zia of BNP. During those meetings, I expressed my view that the national elections should be free and fair, transparent and without violence. Both leaders were adamant in their positions. Sheikh Hasina insisted that provisions were in place to conduct a fair election. Madam Zia maintained that a fair election could not be held without a caretaker government in place to ensure transparency. As of today, the two sides remain at odds, and it is still uncertain whether or not the opposition BNP will boycott the election. In meetings with the leaders, I stressed the need to curtail the growing violence, which can only bring about further instability, possibly leading to the expansion of extremist groups and creating a vacuum that could create broader security risks for the region. I also expressed my concerns about Bangladesh's International Crimes Tribunal, which was created by Sheikh Hasina in 2010 to investigate alleged crimes committed during the 1971 War for Independence, so about 42 years ago. Opposition leaders view the tribunal as a vehicle for the incumbent leadership to punish its enemies and strengthen its hand in the lead-up to the elections. Since the tribunal began handing down death sentences in February, numerous outbreaks of violence have occurred. Critics of the tribunal, many of whom agree that trials should be held and that the guilty should be punished, 
maintain that international standards are not being applied. When I brought this up with the Foreign Minister, I was told, quote, we are actually creating new international standards, unquote. Based on some of the reports I heard about the conduct of the trials, that response was not very reassuring, particularly in light of concerns expressed by U.S. Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who heads the State Department's Office of Global Criminal Justice and was a former prosecutor of the Sierra Leone and Rwanda trials. Ambassador Rapp, who has visited Bangladesh three times in an attempt to advise the ICT and the government on international standards, was largely ignored. Among the issues about which he expressed concerns were interrogation without cause, lengthy pretrial detentions, a lack of sufficient protections for witnesses and victims, and allowing prosecutors to call more witnesses than defendants were allowed to call. Hopefully, we can have some discussion about the Court this afternoon, among many other issues that we will be discussing. So in a nutshell, I would say that Bangladesh has much going for it and much standing in the way of its continuing progress. I look forward to hearing from our excellent panel of witnesses uh, here this afternoon and hope we can address some of the issues in greater detail. And I would now like to call out of order the gentleman from uh, California, I believe the ranking member of the TNT mm -hmm. uh, Committee, uh, Brad Wenstrup uh, from, or, excuse me, Brad Sherman from uh, uh, California uh, to uh, make a statement. Yeah. I regret my wife isn't here. She spent uh, a year working in Bangladesh with uh, BRAC, the then uh, Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee. I regret I can't spend uh, time here, but I've got to go to our subcommittee uh, uh, to deal with, uh, with Syria. I look forward to reading the transcript, and I hope the witnesses will focus on at least uh, two points. Uh, one of those is the rights of Hindus in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm glad to see that the Vested Property Act, which allowed the confiscation of property from a large number of Hindus, uh, I believe has been repealed, but I'm concerned that successive administrations have not taken steps to return the land expropriated from Hindus under the law. And I'm concerned with the other um, human rights uh, abuses I hear visiting, uh, visited on uh, uh, religious minorities in Bangladesh. And uh, that is why so many of us have co-sponsored the bill to establish a separate office uh, in the State Department to deal with uh, religious minorities in the Middle East and South Asia. Second, I'm concerned about uh, Mohammed Yunus and the uh, Grameen Bank, which of course won the Nobel Prize for their outstanding work in development. Uh, the government has moved toward, uh, uh, in effect, taking it over, pushing uh, Yunus out as managing director, and I hope the witnesses will address that issue. I look forward to uh, uh, reading your comments. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I'd now like to recognize the acting uh, ranking member today, Ms. Gabbard, for uh, five minutes to make an opening statement. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. I appreciate uh, your holding this very important hearing today and would like to also thank our witnesses for joining us and everyone who took the time to come to uh, discuss these important issues uh, that we all care very much about. Uh, there's no question, as the name and focus of this hearing suggests, Bangladesh is currently in a state of turmoil. As the country heads towards elections early next year, there are many concerns about the stability of the country, which has come to share significant ties with the U.S. on so many fronts, whether it be counterterrorism or trade or the mitigation of natural disasters. As our relationship continues to grow, part of this growing friendship creates the opportunity for us to have candid conversations whenever there are concerns that are arise, which we will have today. I am particularly concerned over issues, as uh, Mr. Sherman mentioned, uh, regarding religious freedom and specifically over attacks on the minority Hindu community remaining in Bangladesh today. I think it's unfortunate that sometimes perpetrators of crimes against this community go unpunished, and it's up to the government of Bangladesh to act authoritatively against those who incite and commit violence against anyone and protect the rights of all minorities. I look forward to this subcommittee uh, under the leadership of our chairman as well as uh, another subcommittee for the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee as a whole uh, in taking up this issue in particular. Additionally, the languishing labor situation in this country is troublesome. Since the Rana Plaza tragedy in April, where over 1,100 garment workers were killed and over 2,500 injured, 
there was a renewed focus on the labor sector by the government and the private sector. Both do carry a responsibility to ensure that worker rights and safety standards are being met in that country. Changes seem to be slow in coming. On November 18th, the Wall Street Journal reported that Walmart found still more than 15 percent of the factories in its initial round of safety inspections in Bangladesh failed safety audits. The U.S. continues to be concerned about the political deadlock between the two major political parties, in particular around the upcoming elections and the increase in violence that this deadlock creates. Our Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asia, Nisha Biswa, just returned from Bangladesh and reiterated the U.S.'s position that the opposing parties must come to an agreement over the elections to ensure that there is a prevention of any further violence. We hope that both parties engage directly in a constructive dialogue in order to create this environment for free, fair, and credible elections to occur. I think that this will be a critical measure as we look at the U.S.-Bangladesh relations moving forward. There are areas where Bangladesh has seen improvement. The economy has grown 6 percent per year over the last two decades despite a range of challenges. The poverty rate has dropped from 40 percent to 31.5 percent over just the last five years, lifting millions out of poverty. And it's important for us to take note of these metrics and to see how we can continue to grow in this area. I think Bangladesh's long-term prospects are strong, <coughs> primarily because of the strength of its human capital. The population is young, hardworking, and the people as a whole are resilient. Overcoming these areas of concern to expand growth is key to ensuring the success of Bangladesh. I look forward to our discussion today to see how we can continue to engage to address some of the human rights concerns, the concerns around religious freedoms and persecution, and make sure that all people are protected as this great country grows both economically and past political instability. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to now introduce our uh, distinguished panel here this afternoon, and I'll begin with Dr. Uh, Ali Riaz, uh, who is a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center here in Washington. Uh, he is currently on a sabbatical leave from Illinois State University, where he is the chair of the Department of Politics and Government. Previously, Dr. Riaz taught at the University of Bangladesh, England, and the University of South Carolina. He has additionally worked as a broadcast journalist for the BBC World Service in London and has a long list of publications focused on South Asia politics. We welcome you here this afternoon, Doctor. I would also like to uh, introduce uh, Major General Munir Uz Zaman, uh, who is currently the President of the Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, as well as the current Chairman of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. He is a former career military officer who served 37 years active duty and had the distinction of serving as the military secretary to the President of Bangladesh. And General Munir is a graduate of the Malaysian Armed Forces Staff College, National Defense College, National University of Bangladesh, and the United States Naval War College. He led the Bangladesh country contingent to the UN Trans, uh, Transitional Authority in Cambodia and led the past election UN mission in Cambodia to monitor the political and security situation in that country. He sits on the Board of Governors of Council for Asian Transnational Threat Research and is a frequent speaker on international security and policy issues. We thank you, General, for being here this afternoon. And our final witness will be John Sifton, who is the Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch, where he works primarily on South and Southeast Asia. He previously served as the Director of One World Research, a public interest research and investigation firm. Prior to that, he spent six years as a researcher in the Asia Division at Human Rights Watch. Mr. Sifton also worked for the International Rescue Committee on Afghanistan and Pakistan issues and at a refugee advocacy organization in Albania and Kosovo. He holds a law degree from New York University and a bachelor's degree from St. John's College in Annapolis. And we welcome you here as well, Mr. Sifton. Um, and uh, this afternoon, uh, we'll be going by what we call the five-minute rule. Each of you will have uh, five minutes. Uh, a yellow light will come on when you have one minute left. If you could try to wrap up by the time the red light comes on, we'll give you a little leeway, but uh, we'd ask that you wrap up as close as possible once the red light comes on. And Mr. We'll, we'll hold the same, uh, the same rules here. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Unfortunately, I have another commitment. 
I would ask unanimous consent that my opening statement be entered into the record. Without objection. And if you would like to make a, a brief opening statement, I would allow it. I am I, I, glad we are holding this hearing. I think Bangladesh is a very important uh, nation, obviously, in uh, Southeast Asia and um, with a lot of challenges, but also an enormous promise. And so I, I applaud you and the ranking member for uh, exploring those issues uh, and, uh, and hopefully uh, working through our bilateral relationship to uh, to a more fruitful end. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Dr. Rios, you're recognized for five minutes. If you each would hit the button when you're testifying, then Michael start operating. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Shabat, uh, the members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to discuss the political situation in Bangladesh. I have submitted a written testimony. Please accept that one as my statement, and I will summarize some of the points that I have mentioned in my written statement. As we all know, Bangladesh, uh, Bangladeshi politics is once again at the crossroads. In recent months, the situation has taken a violent turn as the opposition organized several general strikes which led to death and destruction and has threatened more in the coming days. The human cost of the violence is rising rapidly. The government, on the other hand, has used excessive force to quell the opposition and resorted to the persecution of the opposition leaders. The immediate reason for the current political impasse can be traced back to the 15th Amendment of the Constitution, which removed the caretaker government, which ensured three fair elections since 1996. The point of contention is whether the election time government should be comprised political leaders or nonpartisan individuals. The opposition alliance, led by the BNP, insists that the government, uh, manned by politicians, will influence the election results in favor of the incumbent. The fundamental reasons for the introduction of the caretaker government in 1996 were the absence of trust among the political parties and of strong institution that can be trusted to hold an acceptable election. While current incumbent and the opposition parties have been in power since 1991, neither has tried to create necessary institution, nor has the climate of mistrust changed. Public opinion polls since the removal of the system show an overwhelming support for a neutral caretaker government during the elections. And the second point is the importance of an inclusive election. The upcoming election is important at both domestic and regional levels with significance for the U.S.-Bangladesh relationship. Despite transitioning the military rule in 1991, Bangladesh has not produced an inclusive, uh, uh, it has uh, uh, four inclusive election, but didn't produce a very significant uh, democratic institution. One of the key issues is the International Crime Tribunal that you have mentioned. Uh, these trials of those who perpetrated genocide and committed crimes against humanity during the War of Independence in 1971. Trying a war criminal was an election promise of the Obama League. Despite some reservations about the trial process, opinion polls have shown that the majority of Bangladeshi citizens support the work of the ICT. Whether it plays a role in the upcoming election or not, in my opinion, the trial of those who committed crimes against humanity in 1971 should continue. This was long overdue. Without dealing with the painful past and delivering justice, the nation won't be able to move forward. What are the future trajectories? We see three options at this point, three possible scenarios. One is a routine election participated by all parties. However, given the uncompromising positions of the ruling and the opposition parties, it is an unlikely scenario at this moment. Accommodation of some of the demands of the opposition, perhaps a cabinet not headed by the incumbent PM, is the way out within the current constitutional proviso. Opposition should be ready to make compromises. Number two. An election boycotted by the opposition. This scenario is close to what happened in February 1996, when the BNP unilaterally arranged a sham election. Despite apparent similarities between 1996 and 2013, the situation on the ground is different this time around. Few allies of the ruling party will join the election. The legitimacy of such an election is an open question. Such elections do not produce a durable parliament, nor bring political stability. Third option is the deferral of the election. It can be done within the purview of the current constitution or through extra constitutional steps to be ratified post facto the parliament. One of the articles of the Bangladesh constitution stipulates that election will be held within 90 days after the dissolution of the parliament. Therefore, if parliament is dissolved, the window of time can be used to formulate a solution through mediation between the political parties. Since caretaker government issue was never placed before the public for approval, one way out could be a referendum on the issue during the extended period. 
the general election can follow the, based on the election results of the referendum. This will give all parties a sense of victory. Finally, the role of the international community. The United States and the international community can take the following steps that I would recommend. Number one, instead of focusing on elections every five years as tension escalates, the United States should emphasize on the quality of democracy. Concrete action steps should be laid out to be followed by the political parties. For adherence to each step, the country should be rewarded with benefits that help the entire population or the most productive sectors of the country. For example, restoring the GSP, easing the tariff barriers for the productive sectors, especially ready-made garments. Number two, building an institution for sustainable and quality democracy, such as strong election commission, should be the key focus of the international community and commitment for long-term engagements is necessary. Number three, the United States should make clear statement in regard to the post-election tolerance, including safeguarding the weaker section of the society, particularly religious minorities, and the results of those fallout. Number four, encourage all parties to agree on containing religious extremism. Number five, the international community should neither franchise its responsibilities to regional powers, nor should the regional powers be excluded from this international effort. In particular, India's valid security concerns must be, must be addressed. An institutional structure should be created to ensure that domestic political environment in Bangladesh does not threaten its neighbor or the regional security. The present political crisis in Bangladesh can be turned into an opportunity to build a stable, democratic, prosperous country. Economic and social achievements of recent decades show that citizens are capable of taking steps in the right direction. It is time for Bangladeshi political leaders to take the right decisions, that is, to hold an inclusive election, agree on post-election tolerant behavior, rein in extremism, commit to address the issue of war crimes judiciously, and commit to regional peace. And it is time for the international community to help them in this regard. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. General, you are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and honorable member, thank you again for inviting us to testify before this committee. What I would like to start by saying that I shall cover some of the salient points of the written testimony that I've given and address the main issues of the questions that were posed to me. It is pertinent to say that a combination of multiple forces of political violence, weak governance, corruption, poverty, and rising Islamic militancy is very rapidly hurting the very core of the Bangladeshi state and turning it into a fragile state. The lack of political trust between the two political parties and particularly between the two leaders of the parties has made the democratic process in the country dysfunctional. The current state of political impasse comes with a very resolution that was passed and the amendment that was passed in the parliament of the 15th amendment which people perceive was done by the government with ulterior motives. The resultant protest by the opposition and its allies, including the Isla Jamaat Islami, has brought widespread violence on the street and has re resulted in over 200 deaths in the last few months and injured many more. Experience of Bangladesh's history of elections shows that incumbent government has the capacity and the means to manipulate and rig election. Therefore, a wide majority of the people want a neutral caretaker government to hold the elections and that is the only way out of the current political impasse in the country. The country has had weak governance for many years, and the state of law and order was poor, and crime was on the rise. There were political force disappearances over the last few years. Industrial labor standards were very appalling, resulting in Rana Plaza incidents with impunity. We also saw the squeezing of the space of civil society, and the role of civil society has been curved over the last few years, and the freedom of press and expression is under threat as journalists are in jail for expressing their opinions. TV channels and newspapers have been closed, and the culture of winner-take-all approach has made the government's position very rigid. There is also widespread corruption in the country, and a prevalent chronic capitalism persists. It is also important to say that the poverty reduction that has taken place over the last few years 
has also been hit by the government's stance against the Grameen Bank and particularly against Professor Eunos. I would like to say that there is a rising tendency of Islamic militism in Bangladesh and that is going to hit at the very core of the Bangladesh stand as a secular and a moderate state. The reasons for this rise is due to a multiple forces of internal impacts and external impacts. But the point that I would like to very much emphasize here before this committee is that the current state of political intolerance by the government towards its opposition and the current state of the political violence that persists in the country, if this continues, the country will soon enter a phase of instability and any instability in Bangladesh will create the ground for militant parties and organizations to thrive and expand their scope of operation within the country. We also see that any militant operations in Bangladesh will have impacts on the regional security, particularly because of the 1920-14 withdrawal of the U.S. forces from Afghanistan, where the security of the region will become very fragile. I would also like to say that in this state of fragility, the relationship between the United States and Bangladesh needs to be observed very carefully. A question was also posed, what needs to happen for a stable, secure, and accountable government in Bangladesh? What I would like to say that we first need a change of the political culture. We need important government organizations to be reformed, including the judiciary, which has to be free and accountable. We need enforcement to make election commission, anti-corruption commission, and other bodies more functional. There has to be a definite role of the civil society in expanding the space and making the government accountable. The system of impunity by government and its cronies has to stop so that the rule of law can be established. And we need a free and a robust media, and media should not be hampered by the government. We also need political forces on issues of state, and we need national policies, not personal and private policies. We need an educated population to enforce that their governments are held accountable. A very interesting question was also posed to me, saying that in this current state of the impasse and the political violence that persists in the country, will it risk the army coming into play again in a military coup? My answer to this question, the military does not have a role in solving political problems in a democratic country. And having seen the experience of 2007, I also feel that the military does not also have the appetite for that. But the fact remains that the military remains the only credible and acceptable institution in the country in spite of the politicization of all state institutions by the current government. The military has remained apolitical, and therefore the military should play the role that is in the best interest of the country, but I presume that if the violence persists, the military at a time may be sucked into the process, but that is not something that we should welcome. I once again say that thank you for the hearing, and I would hope that our international friends and partners continue to engage Bangladesh so that Bangladesh doesn't slip into a, a state of violence and become, say, fragile to fail state. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, Mr. Sifton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for inviting me to testify today at this very well-timed hearing. Uh, the other witnesses have already discussed uh, Bangladesh's dire political situation and the risks it presents. I'd like to focus on the specific human rights issues uh, that the current political impasse has brought to bear and describe in more detail exactly how they will be affected by the events of the hour. So let me first discuss the key human rights issues in play in this current political impasse. The parameters of the standoff are well documented. The ruling party, the Awami League, has refused the BNP's demands for a caretaker government. As a result, and as the other witnesses have already said, there's a very real possibility that the BNP and most of its political allies will boycott the elections, and thus the subsequent parliament and the government that those elections would create. So let's discuss what that will lead to. With that instability will come political volatility. 
in boycotting before and after the elections, the BNP and its allies will presumably hold protests, cartels, shutting down transit and economic activity in key urban areas. And in response, State security forces will use force of varying types, some of it responsive, some of it proactive. Um, and perhaps none of this would be too worrisome in the abstract were it not for the fact that cartels and security forces' responses to them are almost always accompanied by violence, mob attacks by the political factions, and excessive use of force by state actors. I mean, some of the worst violence so far this year occurred between gangs of rival party activists both from the Awami League, BNP, and Jamaat, none of whose leaders, it should be noted today, have done much to restrain their supporters during that violence. Many people are likely to be injured in the future political violence that would accompany a boycott, and likely a large number of people will be killed. Many people will also be detained. And I want to emphasize that this political violence is illegal violence. Every government is entitled, even obligated, to use police powers to maintain order, even the use of force, so long as it's proportional and not excessive. The problem is that in Bangladesh, security forces usually don't exercise force in a measured and proportional way. Human Rights Watch has documented Bangladeshi security forces using excessive force in responding to street protests for years, but including major violence this year. Uh, for instance, the violence in early May that killed approximately 50 people. By our estimates, security forces have killed almost 150 people and injured at least 2,000 since February of this year. And while large numbers of protesters have been arrested, the Bangladeshi authorities haven't held anybody accountable uh, uh, among the security forces for excessive force. So this political instability is going to make matters worse. Um, and if the best predictor of future behavior is, is past behavior, um, we have very serious causes for concern. But the violence is not the only concern. Heightened political volatility in coming weeks and months is going to lead to other kinds of abuses of civil and political rights. Crackdowns on freedom of speech, harassment of journalists' activities, civil society groups. This is already underway. The committee is aware, of course, that a key human rights group in Bangladesh, Odakar, uh, had several members jailed this year. One remains in custody. The harassment of Odakar continues. I went to Odakar's offices last week in Dhaka during a passing visit to Bangladesh, and there were two men on each corner of the street who, from looks and manner, I took to be plainclothes police officers. Their overt surveillance was, frankly, pathetic and thuggish. If nothing else comes of this hearing, we can at least call on Bangladesh's government to end this shameful harassment of civil society groups. The committee is also aware that overbroad and vague laws, such as the information Communication Technology Act um, are, are, are being used to target groups simply for acts of free speech. Uh, this act uh, has been used not only against Odakar, but against journalists and against bloggers in recent months. The breakdown of the political order in Bangladesh is also going to have knockoff effects on other human rights issues beyond the political realm. Um, there are many other human rights issues in Bangladesh, as the committee is aware, women's rights issues, which Human Rights Watch has reported on, the labor rights issues uh, that are the issue of the day, um, and international justice issues connected to the tribunal. Uh, human Rights Watch has supported and continues to support efforts to hold perpetrators responsible for the terrible crimes of the 1971 conflict. But as the chairman has made clear already that tribunal has been marred by deficiencies which have undermined the integrity of its processes. And since this process includes the death penalty, um, there's good reason for human rights groups such as ours to be quite concerned. So all of these important human rights issues will be impacted by the possible breakdown of the political order in Bangladesh. The consequences are clear. So what can be done to address all of this? Well, the United States and other governments have already stated their concerns. From Secretary of State Kerry writing to Sheikh Hasina and the leaders of the opposition uh, to your visit uh, two weeks ago to Secretary, Assistant Secretary Nisha Bilwas's visit just this past weekend, the message has been delivered. But it will help for Congress to further reinforce that message and back up those concerns with warnings about the consequences to Bangladesh if this political crisis spins out of control. 
Everything Bangladesh wants and needs today, tariff reductions, goodwill in Europe to re maintain low tariffs there, continued use of Bangladesh military forces for UN peacekeeping, which is a key source of revenue to the military, uh, involvement in regional security and strategic frameworks. All of this will be put at risk if Bangladesh suffers a political implosion. And on some level, Bangladesh's leaders already know this, but it always helps to remind them. And I hope that, that this committee hearing does that today. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you very much, Mr. Sifton. And now members of the panel up here will have five minutes to uh, ask questions of the witnesses. Um, and I will begin myself. Um, it, it's too soon to say exactly how the elections will unfold in January. Uh, as history has shown, uh, virtually anything is possible in, under Bangladeshi politics. Um, however, we know that opposition leader uh, Khalida Zia met with Bangladesh's uh, uh, Sheikh Hasina two, two days ago, I believe, uh, in which apparently some encouraging words uh, came out, maybe a step forward. But at the same time, there was, uh, they split uh, without an agreement and, and uh, and, and, and uh, Khalida Zia still demands that uh, Prime Minister Hasina step down from office and that a, a caretaker government uh, be put in place to oversee the national elections. Um, Mr. Sifton, you kind of already gave your analysis of what might happen. I'd be interested to see what Dr. Uh, Rios and, and uh, Major Munez uh, could, uh, what, what do you, how do you think, what is the most likely scenario uh, in, in your opinions to play out here? If you had, if you had to, what, what do you think is the most likely? And if you could put your mic on. Thank you. I mean, lately the meeting between uh, opposition leader and the president, the president has a very limited constitutional power. Uh, and in that case, uh, how much you would be able to intervene in this kind of situation is not very clear. Previous situations in the history tells that it is not, but he has a moral power. There is no doubt in my mind that the president does carry some moral power if he wants to. They're a very limited constitutional one. Uh, and going forward, uh, in terms of these three scenarios that I mentioned, uh, I am not very much optimistic about an inclusive election at this point, unless something dramatic happens. And that is what uh, I was suggesting that at least some form of accommodations of the opposition's demands, including at least a cabinet not headed by the incumbent PM, prime minister would be an option, or deferral of the election. But likely scenario is a non-inclusive election that Bangladesh is going to experience. I wish that I'm wrong, but uh, uh, as of today, that's what it looks like. Thank you. General? Thank you, Chairman. My first uh, scenario is that Prime Minister Hasina will try and push towards a one-party election with disastrous consequences for the country, because if she does that, then the country will move in the path of instability, because the post-election violence is going to be even higher than the pre-election violence. The second option that I see is that if she finds it ex absolutely difficult to push towards a one-party election, which is her first desire, then she will probably ask the president to declare a state of emergency by which she can stall the elections, buy more time for herself, and perhaps think that she can bid up on the opposition and civil society to soften the stand and then come back to elections maybe after a year or a year and a half. Mm -hmm. The third option that I see is that the level of violence goes so high that the military reluctantly is sucked into the process to restore some bit of stability in the country and provide security to its citizens. But that is the third option that I see. But in total, uh, the current government stand in trying to solve the problem doesn't seem to be apparent because Prime Minister in the last uh, couple of days in forming the, the so-called interim government has shown that she does not really care about what sort of accommodation is needed to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sifton, let me ask you, having heard the, the two comments there, um, what would, uh, what do you think the, the U.S. and the world's response ought to be, either in advance of the election or afterwards, depending on which option occurs? Well, in the coming weeks and months, um, just because the leadership of the Awami League so far has not 
uh, heeded the warnings that so many people have given doesn't mean the message shouldn't continue to be delivered. Mm -hmm. I think at some point, Sheikh Hasina will have to come to terms with the reality that if she forces through a one-party government, uh, that it will only lead to unended, open-ended protests, which will put at stake everything that Bangladesh wants and needs right now. She may not realize it today, but she eventually will have to realize that the question is, will it be too late by the time she realizes it? So in any case, I, I think the message just needs to be brought again and again and again. She does not have within her own cabinet and government enough people telling her what to do. Okay. Thank you. My time's expired. Uh, the gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. That's uh, Hawaii. I apologize. We're out west. Yeah, <laughs> somewhere out there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of the general thread that has been common through each of your testimonies has been your pessimism at uh, a fair election and an open election, as well as your agreement that if this does not occur, that the post-election violence is likely to occur. I'm wondering if you can uh, tell me a little bit about that post-election violence. Who, who is the target it, it, built based on the scenarios that you're talking about? What constituencies are targeted in that scenario? The violence that is anticipated mostly, the post-election violence, if you look back and, uh, in 2001 and previous elections, and largely the first is the religious minorities and min ethnic minorities. They become uh, a target of all these uh, uh, attacks that we, we have seen previously. And in case of an election, if it is a non-inclusive election or unilateral election, uh, however we identify it, uh, definitely it would be the opposition uh, activist, political activist, who would become target. But even before we reach to that kind of a situation, post-election situation, the election itself will be very violent if this is a non-inclusive election, because the opposition will tend to uh, not only call for boycott, they might try to resist, and hence the violation uh, uh, and the violence would spread. And I'm afraid that this violence might not stay within the boundaries of Bangladesh border. That is the most worrying part. And given the history of Bangladesh of a Islamist militancy, a left-wing radicalism present, all these things are recipe for disaster. At this point, those are the ones that need to be taken into account as well. This time, the political violence in the post-election period is not only going to be resisting the government by the opposition, it will be a question of existence of the opposition forces within the country. There has been statements given out by members of the current government that this is the last election between what they call pro-forces and anti-forces. So it is not going to be a political process of protest, but it is going to be a fight for existence of forces which are not included within the government. I also see that the level of protest can go so violent that there will be widespread loss of life and property within the country. And this has ramifications of spillover beyond the borders of Bangladesh. And Bangladesh, which is so closely bordering with Indian state, and the level of violence that exists in the fenced border between India and Pakistan, where India and, India and Bangladesh where Indian border guards regularly kill Bangladeshi citizens, it is likely that the spillover impacts will have a tremendous amount of ne negative impact from the Indian state and the Indian side. I also see impacts on minorities, both religious minorities and ethnic minorities. So therefore, it is going to become extremely fragile and volatile in the post-election period. Thank you. Mr. Sifton, if, if in your answer you could also include your thoughts uh, or your assessment of how uh, the India-Bangladesh relationship is currently, especially as we're moving into this period? Um, well, first, about the election being unfair, uh, it, it's not even necessary that the election be unfair for there to be protests. Suffice it to say, if the election is run by a government which is not bipartisan, multipartisan, it will be perceived to have been unfair, and that's all that really counts. There will be protests, even if the election was run fully in uh, fairly and freely. So it's, re it's really about the perceptions. 
Second, about the violence that would occur, who would be targeted. I think it's important to understand that, that a lot of the violence during Hartel's is not directed. It, it, it can, innocent people can be caught up in it. Uh, during Hartel's, many victims are ordinary civilians who are just going about their business trying to get around uh, from point A to point B. Um, it, it depends on what time of day it is. There are a lot of factors there. But it, it really is important to understand that it's not necessarily violence directed at particular uh, forces, but rather widespread chaos where loss of life uh, will be high. It's also important to recognize that it's not just uh, political forces who get targeted. The security forces themselves get targeted. And although they have a long track record of abuse, you know, they also get, are killed in this violence. Ordinary police officers um, are killed. As far as the India-Bangladesh relationship goes, it's a very complex one. And I think it's full of, there are a lot of misperceptions about what India wants. Um, it's very difficult to know exactly what India wants. But the important thing is for India to play a constructive role here and not back a winner, or decide things like that, but to insist that a process be run that mitigates and lessens the likelihood of widespread chaos and violence. That's the most important thing here. Not to pick a winner, but to, to mitigate and lessen the likelihood of massive violence and human rights abuse. Thank you. Thank you very much. General East time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, uh, Mr. Uh, Collins, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, it's moving in and out of meetings today, as you well know. A couple of questions uh, for any of you to answer, and preferably all. Uh, Bangladesh has had a growing extremist movement pushing toward Islamic policies to be implemented in that process. How likely is it that we would see civil strife between secular and religious groups to the extent that we have seen in some Middle Eastern, uh, Egypt, others, places where this is a growing problem? In your opinion, is that a growing problem? If so, and it was just mentioned in your, general, in your testimony just a second ago about religious uh, minorities. Uh, I'd like to get your ideas, all three of you's ideas on that. The conflict between the secularist and Islamist forces, particularly in the past years, we have seen the rise of Islamist forces in Bangladesh. Perhaps for a decade we have seen that one. Right. However, I would not say that it has reached to a point that this, there would be a conflict as we have seen in case of Middle East. It is my understanding and my understanding based on my research and others that uh, uh, there would be a growing tension, and that, that tension is already present in, in case of Bangladesh. But all other political uncertainty may contribute to this kind of situation, and that is a worrying part of it. By itself, there is not going to transform into a conflict between the Islamists and the secularists. But if there are continued uncertainty, violence, and, uh, and the political situation, uh, instability uh, within the political situation, that might contribute to that, that kind of a, uh, a conflict in future. But in, in, in short term, I don't see that becoming uh, a major element, though it will remain con constantly, it will remain, remain as a reminder of Bangladesh's uh, I would say the, the issue of identity is there. Of course, the political ideological differences are there. And over a period, it has grown. It, it might continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, what I would like to say, what I said at the beginning, I emphasize again, any state of instability within the country by running a one-party election that the government plans now will have created the space for non-state actors and extremist forces to thrive. And we already see some early signs of that in the form that there has been resurgence of small splinter terrorist organizations which are surfacing in the last couple of months, who were completely not present in the scene before. We also see that there has been impact of the returned migrant workers in the, in the country who bring a different kind of ideology of Islam back to Bangladesh, which is based on the principles of Sufi Islam. And there is a silent clash of the Sufi Islam and the Ohabi brand of Islam that comes back with the migrant workers. We've also seen the impacts without solid proof of some Middle Eastern NGO money coming into Bangladesh and have his, having its impact. We see that there has been a marginalization of people at the grassroots and non-delivery of services by the state to its own citizens and people. So therefore, the space has been created 
by that kind of a state of what I call the Hamas impact, where the state does, does not exist, the non-state actors exist. Okay. Therefore, that kind of a situation is also bring the specter of Islamic forces coming into the play and creating more space for themselves. But I don't really see the kind of play that we have seen in the Middle East or in the Arab Spring coming to Bangladesh anytime soon, but I see that there will be a resurgent forces of Islamic elements coming into the fore if the government persists with a one-party election and destabilizes the country. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a question of what it means to thrive. There's thriving and then there's thriving. It would be a mistake to fear a situation in which established political forces are so weakened that they cease to exist and there's a vacuum which can only be filled by radical Islamist groups which suddenly come on the scene. That's not going to happen. The two established political entities, whatever happens, are going to remain on the scene for some time. What will happen, what this thriving that the other witnesses are talking about, um, doesn't necessarily mean thriving politically, but the bigger fear is that Could I there are radical groups which would ally themselves with with the established political orders. The pol established political groups would ally themselves with radical groups in order to gain political strength. But could we also be, in your testimony, could you be giving more of a Western thought of what thriving politically is and what may be thriving that they're mentioning in the destabilization in an environment that is, yeah. that is I mean, we're, we think of thriving is... They're not going to win elections. That's right. right. Well, but they don't have to. To be and dangerous. I think that, and that's because you're setting up, a, so I think sometimes when we look at this, that is the sphere of us looking at from American policy eyes that we look at it in terms of our, what we believe, you know, through elections and regular process. They've talked about it and what I, it's interesting to hear the two dichotomy here, the two answers, that there is a problem from our perception and the perception on the ground. So that, that Mr. Chairman, I think that's something that, as my time is, is over, I think that is something that I think has infiltrated this region for a long time and is understanding the groundwork on, on definitional issues and things that we can work on, um, you know, from an American perspective and a foreign policy perspective and also from the indigenous perspective as well. So I appreciate you having this hearing and thank you very much. Thank you. I th thank the gentleman for uh, his comments and the gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Meng, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Madam Ranking Member. Um, as we all know, Bangladesh is an important partner for the United States, both as a strategic geographical ally and as a nation that yearns for the political and cultural tolerance values that here in America we work tirelessly to promote abroad. Uh, my first question concerns uh, accidents in manufacturing sites like Rana Plaza and Tejran garments, reflecting a system of workers' protection and labor standards that require improvement. Mr. Sifton has outlined the need for a government uh, institutionalized labor reform, like the formation of unions in his written testimony. How can the United States facilitate the explicit writing and passage of such reform, and what are some other avenues through which we can incentivize uh, real and quantitative uh, labor reform. Um, so what's going on right now in, with the GSP uh, roadmap to return Bangladesh to getting GSP is the best leverage to get the legal reforms and the institutional reforms to Bangladesh's Department of Labor to the labor law itself. The fact of the matter is the federations on the grounds and the other institutions, labor rights organizations on the ground, know fully well exactly what's wrong with Bangladesh's labor law and what needs to be fixed. They've written memos on it with recommendations. It's just a question of getting those political uh, changes made to the law and getting the Department of Labor in Bangladesh to make institutional changes to make those labor law provisions you know, real so that, the, that workers are actually protected. But all of that will be put at risk if there's a political crisis in Bangladesh. And that's why this is such a serious moment in the political realm. Bangladesh and labor standards have a lot of questions to be answered. And in this, I suggest that our international friends and partners, particularly the United States and the bigger markets where Bangladeshi goods go, particularly the ready-made garments, there has to be also a positive kind of engagement 
both on a public and private sector involvement with our industry in Bangladesh. So I'm calling for the U.S. government to engage Bangladesh and its industry. I'm also calling for the U.S. private sector, the retailers, the big Walmarts of the world, to come forward and engage Bangladesh effectively and positively. So there has to be a bipartisan kind of effort in trying to look at the problem and solving the problem. The labor standards are a, in a very sorry state. We need labor law reforms. We need the federations to come and play an effective role. But the existing laws that exist within the country are also very laxly implemented. So we need better governance by the government to implement the existing laws so that the existing laws also are not bypassed by the people and the industry. And we don't want to see the kind of chronic capitalism where industrialists close to the government in power can do things and go about doing things with impunity. Thank you. It is largely a matter of shared responsibility. What happens in Bangladesh, uh, uh, the, the regiment government sector, for example, is a result of private entrepreneurship. And it has benefited from this lax administrative and labor laws. But it is time to utilize those, implement those. Uh, and, uh, and more importantly, it cannot be done only from within the country, given that it is largely for the export sector, uh, there has to be some commitment from outside. And here I see the international community, particularly the United, the United States and the European Union, given the European Union is the largest market of regiment garments. There should be a positive engagement. Penalizing is not going to help at this moment. More positive engagement is necessary not only at the government level, but at the civil society level and also with those who own the industry, the entrepreneurs who have made contribution and the laborers uh, who's, uh, who's uh, basically who have built this industry from absolutely nothing. Thank you so much. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. We'll go to a second uh, round now and uh, I'll recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Um, I'd, I'd now like to focus uh, at least my attention on Bangladesh's International uh, Criminal Tribunal. Um, and Mr. Sifton, if I could start with you, if I could ask you, um, what actions might the U.S. government take at this point to urge the government of Bangladesh to bring the tribunal into compliance with international standards, um, assuming that they're, that they're not yet or aren't at this time? given the Bangladeshi government's unwillingness uh, thus far to implement the recommendations of U.S. Ambassador for Global Criminal Justice Stephen Rapp, uh, which were offered at the request of the Bangladeshi uh, government about a year and a half ago. Um, what would your comment be on that? Well, again, as with a lot of other issues, the patient isn't taking the medication, so it's very tough to, to know exactly what to do in that context. Uh, Ambassador Rapp has made some very good recommendations. I feel that Human Rights Watch has made some very good recommendations, but they haven't been taken to heart. Uh, there's no leverage as there is with the Cambodia Tribunal with funding because there's no international funding for the tribunal. So there's very little left to do except continue insisting on it. But one key thing that really drives home the reality is the depolitization. It's one thing to talk about the shortcomings, procedural shortcomings of the tribunal. It's another to talk about the execution of defendants, the death penalty, in a political context. And I think there is a, is, a, is a place where the European Union, which is opposed to the death penalty, and the U.S., which has a more nuanced view, can get together and say, like, whether you support or the death penalty or not, carrying out death sentences, executions, in a political context, either in the lead up or the immediate aftermath of an election, is a bad recipe for the perception that there's real justice going on. And that's a warning that the, that the EU and the United States can make together. I mean, even India could say that. Okay. Thank you. Well, let me ask uh, any of the witnesses who'd like to comment on this. Um, there have been reports about uh, several disappearances of witnesses for the defense, um, one of whom turned up apparently without explanation in an Indian uh, jail. Um, there are reports about, uh, well, the forced resignation of the, uh, the Supreme Court justice over, I believe, allegations uh, of inappropriate conversations outside the courtroom with, with prosecutors. 
um, allegations about the uh, defense being limited in one case to about three witnesses and then the prosecution having far more witnesses than that. Um, uh, are there any comments on those? Are those true as far as we know? Um, what what uh, concerns relative to fairness and international standards uh, do that raise, uh, especially as was indicated when we're dealing with potential uh, death sentences here? And I'd be happy to hear from any of the witnesses that might want to comment. Okay, Mr. One Sefton. just quick factual point is that the, the Supreme Court Justice in question who resigned did not deny the allegations that he had improperly uh, communicated with prosecutors. Mm -hmm. These were these were conversations that were intercepted by some means and given transcripts to the Economist magazine, which published them. And in resigning, he never denied the substance of, of those. So those allegations are out there. They haven't been rebutted, and they're very, very serious. Yeah. So I just, but I just wanted to factually state that. Yeah. So they're not necessarily just allegations that this happened, at, at least in that case. Well, and I guess the witnesses, if either were allowed three witnesses and the other side allowed more or they weren't, these are facts that can be uh, determined independently, I'm assuming. But um, would any of the other witnesses like to comment on those? General? Although there is widespread acceptance of the trial in Bangladesh by the Bangladesh citizens, but many Bangladeshis are not comfortable with the kind of standards that we have maintained in the trial. Because to bring closure to a case of historical proportion, we have to have standards at the highest order of international standards of legal practices. The questions that you, Mr. Chairman, point out were allegations which were not clarified by the government. So therefore, there is a wide perception that perhaps those happened. And if those are true, then even many citizens will become very uncomfortable when such sentences are going up to the level of death sentences passed against the, the people who are convicted. I think we, not only as citizens, but as international friends who observe the trials, we should continue to engage Bangladesh government in trying to encourage them to have high moral standards of international legal standards in the courts and the practices. Thank you very much. Doctor, did you want to? Uh, I will briefly state that two things are here. Procedural, some of the procedural problems that we have seen, of course, that needs to be recognized, and that's why international engagement with the international crime tribunals need to be continued. However, at the same time, we need to take, put this in the historical context of Bangladesh, that over the past 42 years, these uh, trials are also a matter of closure of the Bangladeshis of the past. Uh, th this needs to, in some ways, uh, a nation was a victim. Uh, in 1971, and I personally don't consider it as a victim of one individual who was killed. Uh, the, the issue of war crime is largely related to the nation, and that's why it needs to be put into this hint historical context and understand why this was necessary and why there is a widespread support. So procedural questions notwithstanding, uh, it should not be separated from the issue of justice for the victim. And here I see victim, uh, the whole nation as a victim rather than individuals. Thank you very much. Uh, my time has expired. I now recognize the chairman of the full uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Ed Royce, the gentleman from California, is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd, I'd like to get down to the bottom line in terms of what has happened in Bangladesh and what I think is the underlying reason and I don't think it's dissimilar to what I've seen in Pakistan. In Pakistan, you have the Diobendi schools, and out of these particular 600 that we're most concerned about are graduated young men who believe in a jihadi philosophy. Now, they are able, because of their use of tactics of terror, to then move against a domestic population that maybe does not share their same views. And they usually target their wrath against, well, in Pakistan, it was Hindus and Christians and others. In Bangladesh today, if we go back to 1947, and we know a lot of this happened at the outset, but you have a total of 49 million 
Hindus missing from the rolls. Many of them, of course, went to India. But recently we have a situation where you've got 1,500 Hindu homes, 50 Hindu temples burned to the ground. And it's not just Hindus. It is also Christians. It is also atheists. It is also animists. It is those who do not uh, take the most fundamentalist viewpoint. Now, that's not most people in Bangladesh. It's a small percentage of the population. But it is that population that has been radicalized and has not been given an education, a wider, broader education. Indeed, the books that they study in are not even in the uh, Bengal language. They're not even in the Bangladeshi tongue. Uh, they're studying something that they don't even understand. They don't know Arabic. Uh, so when they graduate, they don't know anything except what they've been brainwashed to believe, which is it's their mission to go out and try to force conversions. And they do that by oftentimes kidnapping girls or kidnapping women. Uh, they do that also by sowing terror. And we have uh, a situation also where local police sometimes blame the Hindu population. Despite what I've just described to you, all of that destruction, when that last came up, um, a mob of thousands descended on the capital, as you know, thousands of radicals, demanding a change in the Constitution, um, demanding that um, basically their views supersede the views of the wider community. But some police said, well, you know, um, we have a situation where the Hindus created some of the violence because they originally interfered with the construction of a mosque. Now, unless the state in, in, in Bangladesh is ready to come forward and close these particular Deobindi schools, the ones that have been identified as the most radical, the ones that are telling their charges, their, their graduates, to go out and commit this kind of violence. Pakistan, uh, like Bangladesh, are going down roads here where the, the consequences will eventually engulf the state itself. You can see what's happening over in Pakistan when you don't confront it. And many, many times we have raised this with officials inside Pakistan because we've seen the results. It's the same schools, right? It's the same movement. It's the same tactics. The results are going to be the same. You have a continued effective removal of people uh, who do not adhere to the views of the radicals. So just a quick response, if you will. Do you think my judgment is correct here? Is this the wider, deeper problem? The, the schools that you are referring to, uh, Congressman, uh, the Deobandi schools, there is a large number of them. Uh, of course, uh, th this issue has been addressed in some ways, but no not necessarily as robustly as it should be. Uh, there should be reform uh, on the education sector, and more importantly, these are the schools which are, these madrasas which are producing uh, and youth who are not exactly be able to participate in the economic activities. So there need to be a, a reform. Uh, but at this point, I would say this is a small number. And, and whether Bangladesh should travel the path Pakistan has already traveled depends on the political will and overall political circumstances as well. Uh, and that is where I see this instability in Bangladesh is contributing to this kind of situation. That's well, you're, you're down to a Hindu population that's now at 8.5 percent. Absolutely. And, and on an ongoing basis, we see the flight of minority populations. So the government is not doing enough to protect them. And part of that protection is to do something about these schools. I completely agree with you, Congressman. I mean, there has been structural issues. The Bangladeshi population, if we look into, as I have done from 1951, there is, it has been, uh, you know, the dwindling population, which I call the missing millions, uh, 
Uh, and the state has never done what they should be doing. I mean, irrespective of the, of the political parties in power, uh, the Bangladeshi state has failed to protect its minority. Not only the Hindus, uh, we have seen this situation in the Buddhist population lately, right. in the Ramu, that right. what we have seen. This is absolutely a terrible situation that we are witnessing. Unless the state step up and protect this one, and that is why uh, when Congresswomen asked about the issue of the post-election violence, these are the most vulnerable population that we see. I mean, they become the first target of, of this kind of situation. So not only in, in the context of the election, overall, these are the issues that need to be addressed. And we need, you know, I would, I would urge the international community to work closely with not only the Bangladesh government, but the civil society to make sure that these things are not repeated. We have seen it enough, and at some point, Bangladeshis and its partners and, and its uh, well-wishers should stand up and say, enough is enough. And this is the time we should say, enough is enough. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate it. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, the gentlelady from Hawaii is recognized for five minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I, I um, appreciate our, our full committee chairman's remarks of really taking the long view on this and looking at the root cause of some of these problems that we're seeing the symptoms of. Uh, and, and think it has to be included in this conversation. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit further on the issue of the tribunals. Um, it, despite the obvious flaws with the tribunals, uh, clearly this is an issue of bringing about justice 40 years later uh, that is uh, absolutely necessary for these heinous acts of violence against humanity. A uh, little bit of a two-part question. Um, it's my understanding that there was violence against Hindus and other minorities uh, after recent rulings by the crime tribunal convicting some of these prominent leaders who were complicit in the 1971 attacks. What, if, if you could talk to me about how the government responded to these attacks in any way if they did uh, and what more could be done to reduce them further, as well as uh, what other forms of justice can be brought about for the families of the over three million victims of the massacres during that 1971 liberation movement. You can start, uh, Dr. Riaz. Thank you. Uh, in regard to the, the violence that we have seen uh, post-verdict uh, uh, throughout the whole country, and there has not been any effective measures from the government, and unfortunately, the government not only failed to protect them, uh, subsequently, the government has not provided any support to them. Uh, the lip service is all that we have seen. Same we have seen from the opposition party. So at this point, it is not only we cannot simply wait and see what the government is going to do. It is more important that the civil society and particularly those NGOs who are active in the rural areas, they need to work very closely in 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 somehow. Uh, preventing those kind of things. Instead of waiting until the next thing happens, it needs to be preempted rather than uh, you know, a post event some, some sort of a support. So that is, that is an issue that going forward, whatever form of election and post election situations are there, it is not only about today, it is not about tomorrow. There has to be some kind of an arrangement and it is an international support that Bangladesh needs. I mean, civil society needs to be uh, included in this. As for the International Crime Tribunal, as I have mentioned, this, and as uh, Congresswoman, you have mentioned, that it is about the justice. And the heinous crime that has been perpetrated 42 years ago, the nation became a victim, and there has to be justice. And this cannot be simply seen as a procedural matter, one trial at a time. Uh, I think it is a matter of historical proportion, and that is why when we are talking about these three million people who have been killed, millions have been suffering, uh, millions have suffered, all things need to be taken into account. That, and there, there needs to be a closure, and that is what this trial is all about. That's how I see it. That's my opinion. Uh, I have reservations about the trial process. Thank you. In the violence that took place against minorities, not only Hindus, but particularly also against Buddhists in the Ramu Temple area, uh, the government completely failed to protect minority rights and their property and their lives. But I would also like to mention here that minority casualties and violence did not only take place 
by Islamic elements in Bangladesh. It was a result of the very confrontational nature of politics between the two parties. So therefore, a lot of violence were perpetrated by both the parties. In the case, in some of the instances, there were press reports evidence that the violence against the Hindus in the Pabna district recently was carried out by members close to the government's ruling party. And the press evidences came out where the Bangladesh Human Rights Commission had charged the government to say that the perpetrators must be brought to justice. So there is a kind of a proxy war that is going on between the two political elements and the two political coalitions and parties. And somehow, the minorities happen to be in the middle, and they become the victims. I would urge that the government of Bangladesh take a solid stand in protection of our minorities who are very much a part of Bangladesh. Yeah, I, I would only add to those excellent remarks by both witnesses that the, the issue really boils down to the politicization of the, of the process. It's become politicized, and that's hurt it. It's hurt it as a vehicle for justice, as a vehicle for truth, as a vehicle for healing, everything. Because it's been politicized, that has been impacted. The fact that the government is allergic to any kind of criticism, whether it comes from Human Rights Watch, or in publications by The Economist or by Stephen Rapp um, it is, in some cases, an indicator of that. On the issue of violence against minorities, it is a serious problem. And I think uh, Mr. Royce is right to bring it up. You're all right to, to focus on this. The government has an obligation to stop violence against minorities, whether it's committed by political parties or by more radical elements. The only thing I would observe, though, is that there is a distinction here between Pakistan in Pakistan, you have a government security forces, parts of which are supporting radical elements within the government. Thankfully, we do not yet have uh, any evidence of, of that sort of thing going on here, uh, where the apparatus of the state security services is actually fomenting radical groups for their own proxy reasons. If that were to occur, um, then you would really have a very dangerous situation, but thankfully it has not yet. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. Um, I'd like to thank our panel this afternoon for their testimony. Uh, I think it was excellent. I want to particularly thank the general for flying all the way from Bangladesh to be present at this at this hearing. Uh, members will have five days to supplement their remarks or submit uh, questions. If there's no further business to come before the committee, we're adjourned. Thank you.